Uh, so, um, so title of the presentation is Cartizem versus Metoprolol and uh, Rapid AFib, and uh, why we use one and they use the other. So I think some of you will already know what I mean about this, uh, but we'll just start with uh, this. Basically, I'll just pop right into it. So scenario, um, I'm sure many of us have had this happen some way or another. So 82 year old male presents to the emergency department with four to five days of palpitations. Can't really remember, but it's definitely been more than four days. Um, and uh, he's had palpitations and increased fatigue based on this. Um, when the initial vitals uh, from triage are a heart rate of 137 irregular, respirates of 18, uh, blood pressure of 138 over 82, it's afebrile, he's satting okay. Um, there's his weight. Um, so he's got like really review systems is pretty benign, like no chest pain. He's, he hasn't had a cough recently, no GI, GU symptoms, um, no B symptoms, like constitutional symptoms. And he says, really, he's been feeling overall well, except for just more fatigue over the past week or so. Past medical history. I mean, you know, just the medications make sense. You know, you've got, everything's appropriate. And so finally, we take a look at this ECG. So I'll just give you a few seconds. Also question, are you seeing my, my screen in presentation mode or are you seeing like my notes too? Before we were seeing a presentation, now it's just switched to seeing the notes. Gotcha, okay, already. Okay, so basically, from what I saw, we'll, we'll be talking about all this a bit more in more detail as we move on, but diagnosis of AFib with um, rapid ventricular response is made. So diltiazem 20, IV is given, and within 10 minutes, the patient's heart rate goes down to 101. And uh, palpitations, he, he says uh, his palpitations have improved, shortness of breath has improved. Uh, you get cardiology involved. Uh, they come down and they've seen the patient by about 45 minutes later. And the patient's heart rate is back up to about 141. So they prescribe metoprolol, five milligrams IV, and they're going to admit for further investigations. So um, I, I had this moment when I was on uh, CCU uh, and cardiology consults where I didn't, I didn't really know why they were doing that as opposed to something like, why, why not just go with Cartizem? Um, but we'll continue to talk about that as we move forward. So let's do a little bit of a review of atrial fibrillation. So I like this illustration from the Mayo Clinic. So atrial fibrillation, uh, in essence, you've got a bunch of these like impulses from the atria that are, you know, with a, imp the impulses are running at a frequency of about 400 to 600 beats per minute. And that's what's giving you this irregularly irregular ventricular rate. There's no sinoatrial kick and only some of those impulses are actually getting through the AV node based on refractoriness and such. So you see essentially like an irregularly irregular ventricular rate, no P waves, and uh, it becomes classified as uh, a rapid ventricular response. Sorry, there's sirens going by uh, my, my place, but uh, rapid ventricular response when the heart rate's above 100. And this, of course, leads not only to a symptomatic patient, but there's that risk of a thromboembolism. Symptomatology can be anywhere from palpitations and fatigue to syncope to potentially a systemic embolism and heart failure. So I like this from the uh, cardiology handbook. I think that what we do in the emergency department hovers more around B initially. I, I think that we can think about points A, B, and C, uh, where we, we are going to think about reversible causes as we do our initial workup and such. But uh, typically, we're, we're seeing patients as they come in with that fast heart rate, and we want to manage it as best as we can and in a timely manner. So first, I'll just briefly give you the list of, uh, of some of the reversible causes of atrial fibrillation. So you can have that holiday heart syndrome that might be coming up soon, depending on how COVID affects that. Um, you know, PEs can do this, hyperthyroidism can cause this. You, you also have like the myocarditis, pericarditis. Don't forget about MIs. And then you have structural heart disease um, that, can, that can provoke an, an atrial fibrillation as well. So rhythm control is not the focus of my talk today, but I thought I'd just mention it briefly. So in essence, patients unstable, that's where you should be thinking rhythm, rhythm control. Um, hemodynamically unstable, so that can be a medication or cardioversion. 
in a patient who's stable, the, the only time that you're really going to think about doing the cardioversion is if for whatever reason, they've already been anticoagulated for at least three weeks or the onset of the atrial fibrillation is definitively less than 48 hours ago. So that's where the patient can tell you absolutely 100%. This started eight hours ago. I was eating breakfast and all of a sudden it came up or, or whatnot, but they are so sure that they've never had this before. And they know exactly when it came. If, if there's really no certainty on that, then I, then we're more cautious with the weight control or sorry, with the rhythm control, um, based on the potential for an embolism that could be provoked, um, by this. For rate control, um, the initial management, at least in the emergency department, typically revolves around the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, so class 4 antiarrhythmics, like diltiazem or verapamil, or beta blockers, the class 2s, um, metoprolol being the, most, the, the one that I see most commonly. The target rates that we're looking for in patients, generally when I talk to staff about it, is like we want to get it to at least below 110. Um, below 80 would be nice, but below 110 is, is our target. And um, something that we don't necessarily think about as much um, from, from our perspective, but anticoagulation. So generally we're using that CHADS2 VASC score. Um, and if it's zero, we don't need to think about anticoagulation. But if it's one or more, we, we think anticoagulation. Um, there's a question as to about one. I think that's controversial. It, it could go either way if the CHADS VAS score is, uh, is one, but greater than one for sure, we anticoagulate. And if, again, the patient feels definitively that they've had um, these palpitations for less than 48 hours and they are converted to sinus rhythm, that's also when we don't need to think about uh, anticoagulation as much. Okay, so... Um, Based on that discussion, again, going back to the purpose of the talk, rate control agents, and I'm not going to say exactly how they work, uh, but I'm going to give a basic overview. So calcium channel blockers, they act mostly at the AV node. Okay, so there's these L-type calcium channels that are responsible for the major depolarizing current um, in the AV node, and that's what the calcium channel, calcium channel blockers uh, block. So I, I like to, you know, you can just take five seconds uh, in a patient who's got rapid AFib, um, in what condition would calcium channel blockers potentially be, uh, well, would they be contraindicated? Just to take Wolf five seconds. Sorry, what was that? Well, Parkinson White. Perfect. So um, the, uh, in essence, exactly, because then it's going to, by blocking the AV node, it's going to provoke even more current to pass through that accessory pathway essentially, and you could lead them into VFib and potentially cardiac arrest. Great. So beta blockers, um, in essence are acting on two ways. They both, you could say based on what, um, ba based on what is happening with the heart from the, um, the beta adrenal receptor sites, ad adrenoceptor sites, by inhibiting these things, you're gonna slow down the sympathetic activation, and you're also going to slow down the AV nodal conduction. And that's, that's how the beta blockers are functioning to, to slow the heart down. Now, I don't know about you know, everyone involved here, but like I, I've listened to the EM Rap podcast, and in essence, you know, Mel Herbert, in his you know, wonderful Aussie accent, will say that basically, um, we like calcium channel blockers, and cardiologists like beta blockers and he'll say something to the extent of that's it done don't think about it just know that he'll say something like that um so the question is and i think like i apologize for this slide it just seemed way too obvious and i i had to include it um because it just seemed to make the most sense but which one which one should we choose is there actually one that's better than the other um because really the thought is like if emerge docs use one and cardiologists use the other like why why is there that difference so um there aren't actually a ton of studies that have compared these two medications, particularly diltiazem and metoprolol, head to head. There is one from 2005. This was in Turkey. And uh, what they did is they included patients that were older than 18 years um, who had AFib with a rate of greater than 120 and a stable, like a relatively stable blood pressure. Uh, they gave them diltiazem or metoprolol at those doses. And um, the outcome that they were trying to assess, or the outcomes, were either a heart rate achieved of less than 100 beats per minute, 
or a decrease of 20% or just a conversion to sinus rhythm. And that's within 20 minutes of drug administration. They also measured blood pressure and heart rate at those intervals, zero, two, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes. There are quite a few exclusion criteria. I highlight one um, because we'll be talking about this later, but you know, quite a few things that either would be contraindications to a calcium channel or beta blocker, but these patients that um, were more thought might be needed for what medications to give them. So not a huge sample, like 40 patients, uh, 20, they were split in half, ran randomized, uh, 20 in one group, 20 in the other. And in essence, for this primary outcome, um, they found that the diltiazem group and the metoclolol group, not significantly, were successful and pretty similar, like 90% success rates in the diltiazem group and 80% in the metoprolol group. What they, the main difference that they found was at two minutes, diltiazem was, had a higher success rate. Half of the patients in that group versus 15% um, in the metoprolol group at um, a P level of less than 0 0.05. Um, so, and also none of the patients in either group developed hypotension. Uh, there's now the one that is referenced the most by emergency physicians is actually very similar to this study. And, uh, and I'll just, yeah, rake, that's, that's basically what we just talked about. So this is the one that uh, has been featured in the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. And it's from 2014. And it's actually a very similar study uh, was done in Brooklyn. And they take adult patients greater than 18 years presenting to the emergency department. Uh, they gave them very similar doses. You notice that the, uh, the max dose for diltiazem is slightly larger at 30 milligrams. Um, metoprolol is still at um, a max dose of 10. And um, their primary outcome was simply a heart rate less than 100, but within 30 minutes of the drug administration. And they, their blood pressure and heart rate measurement intervals were slightly different going up to 30 minutes every Q, Q5 minutes. Also, you know, a fair number of exclusion criteria. Importantly, uh, heart failure was, was, well, class four heart failure was not included. So they had 52 patients enrolled in this study, 28 in the metoprolol group, 24 in the diltiazem group with a mean age of 66. And so this is a bit, you know, firmer than, um, than the previous study uh, in 2005. So they found that by 30 minutes, diltiazem had a 95.8% success rate versus metoprolol, which is 46.4. Um, and they also said it was, had a more rapid rate of control than metoprolol at every time interval mentioned. Um, with no significant differences in, um, in adverse effects. So issues with both of these studies, because they are quite similar, um, they were convenient samples. So it wasn't like every patient who came into the emergency department with AFib was getting put into these studies. So possible selection bias, not sure. Um, it wasn't noted in the 2005 study, but in the uh, 2014 study, just uh, reference, the trial was stopped um, early. They initially had planned for 200 uh, people to be part of this study, but they stopped at 52. And the reason for this was because uh, I believe the pharmacists involved said that the diltiazem group were reaching the desired endpoint much better than the metoprolol group, so they stopped it. Um, so, you know, stopping trials early is, is, is potential reason for issues uh, with the validity of the study. Um, lots of exclusion criteria that um, do affect how one would debate with a cardiologist in terms of which medication is more appropriate for atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate. Another thing that should be noted, noted I think, is that the drug dosing. So you know, diltiazem groups in each of the studies went from max 20 to 30 milligrams IV, but the metoprolol group stated a max of 10 milligrams IV. And for one, that might not be equivalent dosing. And two, um, I, I think it's, it's not uncommon to see a metoprolol dose of 15 milligrams being given. So it might, they might not have given an adequate amount of metoprolol to actually compare the two appropriately. Finally, we do think about clearly the short-term effects of what we do in the emergency department, but there were real, there were no, there was no follow-up after 30 minutes. Um, so it's difficult to know what happened to these patients after they had their initial 
um, in, initial medication administration up to 30 minutes afterward. But anyway, the conclusion, and this is both from the study and from the skeptic guide to emergency medicine, which I value, um, is the there are some issues with the studies, but it does demonstrate that dotiacin had um, was more effective than metoprolol in achieving rate control in the ED within 30 minutes. And so it gives us something, at least some evidence to compare the two as to why we use one versus the other. Um, and this was, I thought, a nice illustration that you can get from the uh, SGEM website um, that basically just describes the results. Okay, but, you know, then you'll talk to a cardiologist and they'll say, well, um, we use beta blockers um, for, for reasons. Um, so let's, uh, let's go into this a little bit. So after going through and chatting, I think, you know, and this might be, this might not be news to many of you, but the, the reason that they do this is because of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This is, this is key to why they consistently will use beta blockers in the eMERGE as opposed to using calcium channel blockers. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, you don't want to negatively, you don't want to use anything that's going to have negative inotropy. Well, the thing is both calcium channel blockers and beta blockers do have negative inotropic effects, but according to the Merit heart failure study or trial, um, beta blockers have been shown to improve hemodynamics, hemodynamics and survival in patients with heart failure as their base treatment. And so, or part of triple therapy rather. So that's good, but what about calcium channel blockers? And this is going to sort of the crux of where cardiologists get their reasoning. It goes back to this study from 1988. And I've discussed this with a cardiology fellow as well. And he, he was funny because he just said, yeah, it's, it's, it's based on some older study that that's why we do, that's why we use beta blockers in that situation versus calcium channel blockers. And this is the study that I found. So it's a multi-center diltiazem post-infarction trial research group. And this did not focus on heart failure. It was more of a, it was a very broad study. Um, and uh, the objective was to determine if long-term therapy with diltiazem in patients with previous infarction would reduce rates of mortality and reinfarction. And they enrolled patients from 23 centers across the United States and Canada, including obviously, you know, like Jewish General Hospital, MGH, Queen, the Queen E, and the RV, the old RVH. I don't know any of these names, um, but I figured I'd list them in case uh, people here uh, who are listening do. So in that study, they just said that the uh, giving deltaism had a bi-directional effect. It said that it was favorable or unfavorable, depending on the presence or absence of left ventricular dysfunction. So this prompted a 1991 study where we were also involved. I say we, but you know, not, not me, um, that uh, looked at this. They wanted to, as, as they're saying in the title, um, they want to see how diltiazem would affect late onset congestive heart failure uh, in these post-infarction patients. The population, so this is who they included. They had people who were aged 25 to 75 who had confirmed um, in infarctions in the past. They gave them this dose of diltiazem, 60 milligrams QID, starting three to 15 days afterwards. And they followed them for at least 12 months, up to 52 months, checking in on them every three months. The outcomes were total mortality, death from cardiac causes, and non fatal M well, myocardial reinfarctions. And the comparison was simply a placebo. These are the exclusions, but I'll, I'll skip past this for sake of time. Um, okay, so the, the original study had 2,466 patients and they were split as so into the diltiazem and placebo groups. For the, for the new stu newer study in 1991, they looked specifically at ejection fractions of less than 0.4. Um, and that's the numbers that they had. So 297 in the diltiazem group versus uh, 326 in the placebo group. And this is what they found. So they found that as ejection fraction, the base ejection fraction worsened, this is how, how many patients had congestive heart failure on their follow-up. So patients with 
perinfarction and left ventricular ejection fraction less than 0.4 assigned to the diltiazem group more frequently had new or worsened CHF than placebo. This can also be seen on this graphic, um, again, with patients with a baseline ejection fraction of less than 0.4. So the conclusions of the study, that it basically reinforces the results from the initial study, and it suggested that in patients who have low ejection fraction, diltiazem should be avoided. Um, and that is in essence where the cardiologists are coming from. Because if we fast forward now to 2019, this, this particular study, or it's not a study, it's a re, like a, a lit review, um, makes this assessment. They, this, is, this is part of their recommendation that um, effective rate control can be reached with the use of beta blockers, glycosides, or calcium channel blockers. But due to their negative inotropic effect, Treatment with calcium channel blockers is not recommended in heart failure patients with reduced left ventricular function. And this is a 2019 study, and they reference the 1991 study still. So this is where the evidence is coming from. And if we go a little bit back in time, this is the most recent uh, AHA guidelines for management of patients with AFib. Um, they also, they, they give the same explanation that um, calcium channel blockers should not be used in patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction uh, because of the negative inotropic effects. So we're, we're back to this though, you know, like we do this and they do that. Um, so where do we go from here? And I thought that um, this FOMED site had a, had a nice way of looking at it, that the, basically a pharmacist, um, I thought had a pleasant way of, of summarizing where we should go from here. That both beta blockers and calcium channel blockers in the acute setting appear to be effective at rate control in AFib with RVR. Um, but given the compelling benefits of one class over the other and several common comorbidities, I like this, you know, initial selection should take these factors into consideration so that the medications chosen can represent both a short and long-term solution. So I think that's, that's the crux of it, short and long-term solutions. So in our scenario, we, in the acute setting, frequently use uh, diltiazem, which is not necessarily inappropriate for the patient, um, whereas the cardiologists um, tend to be looking at, let's say, the long-term benefits of which medication they're going to be using. And in essence, from what I've been told frequently by staff and by fellows, is that in patients who you do not know what their ejection fraction is, for example, in the scenario just described where this patient has no cardiac history, they opt to use beta blockers first because they don't know what the ejection fraction is. If they knew that the ejection fraction was 55%, they also potentially might use the calcium channel blockers because they work faster. Um, from the studies that we have. But when they aren't aware of what that ejection fraction is, and in, in, it's in a patient where they are suspicious that this patient might have undiagnosed heart failure of some sort, that's why they tend to opt for something like metoprolol as opposed to diltiazem. So I like this flow chart. Um, after listening to Lori's presentation, maybe we should add myasthenia gravis to it as well. But um, I think that. You look here, this is also from the 2014 AHA guidelines. Um, the only scenario where diltiazem is not advised for the management of atrial fibrillation is in um, left ventricular dysfunction or heart failure. And so um, I think that this is, this, this is something that I, I feel is appropriate to think about when we see patients coming into, let's say, the recess bay or when they come in uh, and you see a triage form like we saw in this particular scenario, that if we're thinking heart failure, maybe it, that would be a time to opt for metoprolol as opposed to diltiazem. Um, now, this might all be old news to everyone. So uh, I just figured uh, that was from my experiences when I was on CCU and cardiology consults that I frequently saw essentially the, maybe not the debates, but I saw the use of calcium channel blockers versus beta blockers being, it would come up pretty frequently. So I was just curious, 
I, I sped through this, but if anyone has any thoughts as to what they've seen in their practice or if they have any, or, or we don't have to talk about that either, we can just uh, call it a quits here. But uh, any comments or suggestions?